How many of you are here today because you're interested in becoming self-sufficient by possibly investing in owning your own business or franchise? Raise your hands. Okay, good. We got the right group in the right room. We're going to spend an hour together. You're going to have time at the end to ask questions. We're going to talk in between and, and have questions. But we're going to be talking to you from some 25 years of experience that I've had working with tens of thousands of individuals who believe they'd like to be self-sufficient, but when that turns into a conversation about becoming self-employed, they sometimes get quite concerned. How many of you have that fear of becoming self-employed? <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay. Becoming self-sufficient is a desire that some 75% of the adult population have today. 75% of the adult population have a strong to very strong desire to be self-sufficient. Now, what's the difference between thinking about being self-sufficient that feels good and is exciting and shifts dramatically when you get to the idea of being self-employed? Anybody know? Self-sufficient being in control of your own destiny. Self-sufficient being able to take care of yourself and not have to worry about whether your employer or your retirement fund or your job's going to be around to do that. It's taking control of your destiny. That's what self-sufficient is like. And 70-some percent of us have a natural desire to be self-sufficient. Now, if you go way back in time in our country, guess what most people were? Self-sufficient. Everybody provided for themselves. It was a great time. And then corporate America came around somewhere after the Industrial Revolution and convinced us all that they were the savior. And that if you follow corporate America and you give your soul to the job and the company, that they'll do what? Take care of you. Right, exactly. Now, how's that working for us? Not too well. Somewhere along the line, things changed. And the things that change is we, we actually commissioned a third-party research firm to look at that. And what we found is that the current career economy, what we refer to as the new career economy, is what we're dealing with today, has a lot of pitfalls and a lot of risks associated with it. And that if you're invested in your current career economy, meaning the job market, you need to be aware that the future is not so bright. We're shifting ever so gradually in our society back to becoming self-sufficient. In fact, 75% of all the new jobs that have been created in the last decade or two have been created by small to medium-sized businesses, not big business. Just read in the paper this morning, another 250,000 jobs were lost. Pension plans are underfunded. A large percentage of the pension plans in place today will not be able to pay out on the commitments they have for your retirements and your pension funds. So if you're here today because you're frustrated or you're confused and you'd like to dispel some of the myths of being self-sufficient and turn that into an opportunity to be self-employed, you're in the right room. And we're going to talk you through some things that you might be struggling with or might have had perceptions or concerns or fears about that make you uncomfortable about the idea. Now, what's the number one thing that's keeping you from owning a franchise either in this room or somewhere else today? Money. Isn't that interesting? That comes up all the time. The number one thing that's keeping us from our dream of being self-sufficient and our goal of taking a business and treating it as a vehicle to help us become self-sufficient, there's something outside of ourselves that's in the way. Now, what's with the money deal? Why is that a problem? You don't have it. <laughs> okay, good point. Thank you. Isn't it interesting that we believe that we have to have the money in order to make a business work for us? But in fact, is that the case? What's one of the largest industries in our economy today? Banking, financing, funding. The SBA, the government, are all focused on making sure that small to medium-sized businesses can get the money. By the way, there's no shortage of money, in case you haven't realized that. It's plenty out there. 
It's just a matter of getting your share of it and using it in the right way to leverage yourself into an opportunity called a franchise. So we're going to spend some time talking about that, dispelling the myths. Now entering the opportunity zone, please discard your preconceptions. What are preconceptions? Those are things that we've already predisposed in our mind that we refer to as seeker perception criteria. You're seeking opportunity, but you have perceptions and you've developed criteria that lead to preconceptions about things, which make us discount things. How many of you have walked through the entire exhibit hall so far? Okay. How many of you are walking up and down the aisle looking at the signs, looking at the booths, and in your mind saying, yes, no, maybe? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, isn't that interesting how that works? How would we know walking up and down the aisle? Because you know how most people feel that they're going to know the right opportunity? How do you think most people answer that? Very good. Young lady up here says, I'll know it when I see it. That's what most of us believe. We think it's like falling in love. That we're going to walk up and down these aisles and through osmosis, something's going to happen that's going to give us a sign that we'll know which ones to talk to, which ones to eliminate. Because we have preconceived ideas. Okay, how many of you want to own a business that goes out and cleans people's homes? Well, not if you're the one that's going to clean the homes, but it's a very, very viable business. So we're going to talk about some of these preconceived ideas. Could a myth be keeping you from becoming a legend in your own business? That's the question you've got to ask yourself. Could a myth or preconceived ideas or my own beliefs or lack of knowledge or information be holding me back from becoming a legend in my own business? Now there's a lot of myths that we're going to talk about. In fact, we're going to zero in on seven myths that most people over the 25 years that the Entrepreneur Source has helped tens of thousands of people become business owners. These are the things that we've dealt with with the majority of those individuals. Finding the right business will make me successful. That's why we're walking up and down the aisles. We're looking for that right business. What is it? It's not about finding the right business to make you successful, because here's the bad news. Most of you believe that finding the right business is going to create success for you, when in fact, success comes from the inside out. It comes from what you're going to do with a successful business format. So it's not about finding the right business. The secret to success in business is finding a franchise doing something I love. Now, how many of you have ever read an article or a book or a, heard someone say, go do what you know and love and enjoy and success will follow? Okay? That's a myth. If you look in our society, people who go do that and launch their own businesses have a slightly higher failure rate than people who launch franchise businesses that have no background, no knowledge, no experience with that product or service. In fact, if you want to read an excellent book, there's a book called The E-Myth Revisited. Anybody read it? Very good. It's a great book. It'll help you understand why the perception is go start your own business in something you have background, knowledge, love of, and go do that and you'll be successful. In fact, the opposite is true in our society. They create the largest percentage of failures. Why is that? Because they become the technicians of those businesses. So it's not about finding something you love. The key is understanding what makes you comfortable and what things you love and enjoy in life and why and find a business that will create an environment whereby you can do that. Now we've spent decades creating a science around this of how to do that and the key is three things. Goals, needs, and expectations. When you focus around your goals, your needs, your expectations from business ownership and you look for business models that will help you accomplish those, that's how you'll find something you'll end up loving as a byproduct of doing. I'll know the right opportunity when I see it. We talked about that. Most of us believe that's true. 
It's not going to work that well for you if you just keep roaming up and down the aisles hoping to fall in love. Most businesses go belly up. How many of you are afraid that if I start my own business, I might fail? Good. Okay, thanks for being honest. That's something you need to consider. What you want to do, though, is try to avoid risk, right? If I can avoid all the risks, then I won't fail. Is that what you really want to achieve, avoiding risk? No. Don't try to avoid or eliminate the risks because you also diminish the opportunity. The key with a franchise business is to manage the risk in a way that allows you to operate a successful business. If I said to you, I got a great business for you, you've got about 84 employees that are typically in the business 24 hours a day. By the way, the turnover ratio is about 300% with the employees and they're typically teenagers or senior citizens. Are you interested in that business? Not based on those statistics, because there's a lot of risk when you start hearing about those things. But guess what business that is? McDonald's, very good. It's all about managing risk that other people won't manage, and that's what franchise systems and business models are based on. So most businesses don't go belly up, if you have a good business model, a system, and you have a franchise that's dedicated to helping you avoid the, or manage the risk that you typically try to avoid. Owning a franchise is like having a boss. The franchise or will dictate everything. How many of you are concerned about the franchise concept because of that? I want to be my own boss, right? I want to be independent. Okay? And that's okay, because guess what? None of these businesses that you see in this hall today, this weekend, would be here if someone didn't start an independent business. So we're not saying independent businesses are bad, because if it wasn't for businesses starting out that way, there would be no franchise concepts. Okay? So don't be too concerned about the franchise or dictating everything, because all they really care about is your success. The only way a franchisor can ever succeed is having successful franchisees, meaning you, and other people that are working their system and developing the system to grow and, and to prosper. It's called interdependent relationship, not independent. So if you think you want to be the boss, you think you want to be totally independent, you think you want to get up every morning and look in the mirror and call all the shots, then you want to start your own business. Okay? If you're going to do that, make sure you have a lot of help and advice, good mentors, business coach, uh, experts that can help you in all the elements of running a business today. It's complicated. I can't be creative in a franchise. I'm creative. I want to get out and show that creativity in business ownership. Don't you want to do that in your local communities and how you develop and grow your business? And you're thinking, well, a franchise is so restrictive, I can't be creative. Next time you go into McDonald's, look at the menu. Take off hamburgers, cheeseburgers, french fries, Coke, and milkshakes. And see how many items are left. There's quite a few. Guess where every single one of those successful menu items came from? Creative franchisees submitting ideas for approval and development collectively by a group. Do you know that every single one of Ray Kroc's menu items failed? Not some of them. Every single one of them failed. The successful menu items came from franchisees all working to improve and develop the product line. Buttermilk biscuits, which is a hallmark of their breakfast items, started out in the South because of competition, and they needed to have buttermilk biscuits on the menu, and it developed into something that's now the largest part of their franchise system, which is breakfast. So you can be creative. Where can you be creative in a franchise? Managing, marketing, and promoting that. Coming up with ideas, sharing them with your franchisee peers and the franchisor. That's how you do that. Now, When's the last time you walked into a McDonald's and saw a vending machine in the lobby that sold pantyhose? 
You guys missed that one, the newest one? Well, you don't see that one because that was an idea that some franchisees had for McDonald's. And guess what? That one didn't make it. So some of your ideas for your creativity may not fit into the business model. You have to be okay with that. A franchise requires more money than I can afford. Isn't that funny? We started off with that. Franchises typically require more money than most of us can afford. If you're looking at buying it using your own dollars and savings and investments or what you can get from the family or what you've got buried in the backyard in a coffee can. It's not about having the money. It's about using money the way it was created to be used in a business. And how is that? How do you use money in a business? You invest. You use it as a resource, as a tool. It's an integral part of the business environment. The majority of successful businesses in this hall or anywhere wouldn't be here today if they relied on their own dollars to grow and develop or invest in those businesses. So it's okay that you may not have all the money tucked away in the mattress. Now franchising to some of us is thought about as the F word. Oh my God, franchising, that's scary. You know, I lose control. They have all the control. It's not necessarily the way for me. I'm not gonna have the freedom I want. I don't want somebody telling me what to do. Those are some of the myths that we've talked about that create that anxiety level about the word franchising. The key to it is franchising is nothing more than a way of doing business. It's a format. How many of you remember back when mom and pop had the corner grocery store? A few of you, are, not many of us are old enough to remember that. I'm ashamed to say that I, am, I do. But today, what's on the corner? 7-Eleven. Who owns the individual 7-Eleven stores that you're going into that you once went to the corner grocery store? Mom and pop. People. Nothing shifted other than the format of the kind of business that people are investing in. Instead of doing it on their own on the corner grocery store, they're leveraging that through franchise ownership. It's a smart way to go. So when you think about franchising, don't try to leap out the nearest window and avoid it, especially if you're risk adverse or you want to minimize or manage or control the risks that are keeping you from being successful and building your own business through a franchise. It's not necessary. Okay, now the F word stands for a lot of things that could get in your way. One of those is frustration. How many of you are frustrated or confused as you walk up and down and not knowing what you should do? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you are honest, some of you are not sure yet you're, that you're confused or you just haven't fallen in love with the right thing yet. Okay? But there is some frustration that's going to come from shifting away from the, from the new career economy that we're dealing with today in the job market, which by the way, new doesn't mean new and improved. New means it's not what it used to be, and it's not a healthy environment for us to continue to invest. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't at least learn about the alternative to becoming self-sufficient and controlling your own destiny, the current or new career economy is going to catch up with you sooner or later. So you at least need to research. You at least need to do some exploration so you know what your options are, because in the not too distant future, you're going to walk into work and it's going to be the day that the pendulum shifts far enough to the side where you decide to do something on your own. So you need to be prepared for that. You don't want to have to start over at that time and start looking for options. Another F word you're going to deal with is fear. How many of you felt at least a little fear about the idea of leaving the, the known security, perceived security of the job market or your current career and going into something you haven't done before. How many will admit they have a little fear around that? Okay. A lot of fear around that. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's not unusual. And what, what do we know about things that we're uncomfortable with or that we haven't done before? 
it creates a level of anxiety and discomfort that in our society means danger. We don't embrace change well. How many of you have read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Very good, okay. If you haven't read that book, you need to read that book. And if you have read it, and you haven't read it in the last six months, you need to reread it as it's based on the shift of paradigm it's gonna take for you to jump in and do your own business or own your own franchise. It's all about change. The only reason you have fear, by the way, the acronym for fear is what? False evidence appearing real. Those preconceived ideas that you have, that perception criteria that you're working from creates false evidence that appears real to us. The reality is that there's not a lot to fear from franchise ownership. How successful is franchising overall? Anybody heard any rumors? It's fairly successful. Most franchise businesses that start off in a particular location providing a particular product or service, three, five, and ten years later are still there providing that same product or service in the same locale. The far majority are still there. But what you need to consider is that not the, maybe not the same owner who started it will be there. So just because franchising is successful as a business model and those businesses continue on, there is turnover within those businesses. So you might start a franchise, work hard at it for a year or two, and decide this isn't for me, sell it to someone else, and they'll carry it on and it'll still be in business today. Good news though, anytime you're thinking about entering a business, think about an exit strategy. The exit strategy for a franchise is far easier than trying to sell your own independently owned business. Okay, far easier. So the exit is much easier. So false evidence appearing real is the other F word you're gonna deal with. It's just the lack of comfort. Nothing you love or enjoy today or are comfortable with did you know you would be until after you experienced it. Embrace the idea of business ownership. The same, same things can happen to you there. Economic impact, franchising. Providing more than $506 billion in private sector payroll. $506 billion, producing $1.53 trillion in economic output. So if you think franchising is some little, you know, side thing that people do for, uh, you know, for a living and it doesn't amount to much in our economy, it is very, very important to the economy of the U.S. today. So you got frustration, you got fear. The other F word that comes into play is failure. We talked about that. Fear of failure. Most franchise businesses don't fail, but some do. In fact, some people fail operating successful franchise systems. So what's with that? How can that happen? Aren't I guaranteed to have it work just because I invest in it and open the doors? No. Because in a franchise, 80% of everything you need to succeed, all the, the discipline that's required to keep that business model going on, on and on and on and being successful is provided to you by the franchise in what's called a franchise system or business model. 80%. We call that system discipline. So the good news is, instead of having to come up with 100% of the things you need to do, as you would in your own business, 80% 80 or, 80 or more is provided to you through system discipline in a franchise. The other 20% comes from you. You add the secret ingredient, which is self-discipline. When you apply the 20% self-discipline, to the 80% system discipline in a franchise, the outcome is success. So those people who go into franchises and aren't self-disciplined enough to follow the system 
and to work the business model you invested in, they can fail in a very successful business model. Some of the most successful franchise systems in our society have franchisees that have failed. Now, finances is a part of it. We talked about that. That's not so difficult in today's economic situation. The lending institutions are in a bit of a dilemma right now. There's a lot of money to be put into work by lending it. And the areas to lend it to have sort of had some problems recently, haven't they? How's the real estate market? Okay. How's the equity, the uh, private equity business? Bear Stearns and, and, and some of these investment companies are looking at larger deals are having difficulty and have pulled back. Small to medium sized businesses is a great place for businesses such as your local bank or credit unions are now looking at very seriously at providing funding for you to actually bridge the financing part. Of course, we talked about the frustration of the whole thing. The money you invest in a franchise will be a way to diversify your portfolio from reactive investments. How many of you are going to use some investments you have, such as your retirement, your stocks, your bonds, as part of the investment in a business if you go into it? Okay. Those funds that are in invested currently, how much impact do you have or how much say do you have whether they go up in value or go down in value? Zero. It's called a reactive investment vehicle. Isn't it amazing the majority of our society just puts all of our wealth out there and all of our savings for other people to manage for us and hope and wish and pray that it goes up? Well, how's that working for us in the stock and bond market lately? Some of you might be doing well. Some of you may not have done so well. The key to investing in a business is taking part of your reactive investments and shifting them to a proactive investment vehicle where you're behind it. Now, you have a direct impact on how well that investment does. How many of you work very, very hard for someone else today for a paycheck? How hard do you think you'll work for yourself with your own money invested? Be a lot easier, right? You won't have to work as hard, right? Of course you're going to work hard. You're already working hard to create wealth and equity for your boss and that company and those stockholders you're going to work just as hard, if not more so, for yourself. So the key is be open to diversifying some of your investments from reactive into proactive investment vehicles, such as a franchise or a business, and get behind that. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you look at the average return on the stock market over the last 10 years, and you blend that together, and you look at the average return on investment that a person investing into a franchise has over a 10 year period that builds income and lifestyle for them and wealth and equity, it's far better, far greater. In fact, if you look at just the franchise companies that are traded public, publicly and what they've done over the last 10 years compared to the rest of the stock market, there's about a 300% difference with the franchise companies as far as that investment vehicle. So reactive investments are okay, but a portion of it needs to be proactive. You need to take responsibility. We need to take back the responsibility for developing wealth and equity for ourselves. Do you think there's the opportunity to build wealth and equity in the job market today? Do you think it's going to come back? Not likely. Okay, that ship has sailed. Time has come for us to look at things differently. Now, it seems like you might be looking at taking a headlong plunge into the unknown as you ponder the idea of just putting your savings on the line, borrowing some money, signing a franchise agreement for how long does a franchise agreement for? Anybody know? Ten years, Ten years minimum for most, some longer. That's a big commitment, isn't it? 
So it seems like this big headlong plunge into the unknown. But there's a lot of safety associated with the entire realm of franchising. How many of you know what regulates franchise offerings in, in the U.S.? Right, it's the Federal Trade Commission regulates all franchise offerings through what used to be called the UFOC. By the way, they changed that this year. It's now called the FDD, the Franchise Disclosure Document. Real simple, straightforward. That's exactly what it should be called. Um, but they regulate what franchisors have to provide you in the way of information. And they regulate the types of things that need to be in that document so you have the ability to become very well informed and educated. You also have the ability to talk to dozens of people who have already invested in that franchise or out there operating those businesses, get an opportunity to see what kind of lifestyle they've developed for themselves, how their income is, whether they would do it over again or not. Okay, whether it really was, were they as nervous and as scared as you are when they started? And what you'll find out is yes, they were. Everybody goes through it. Some of you are thinking, I'm just so nervous and scared and uncertain that I'm probably not right for franchise or business ownership. These other people that do that, they're risk takers. They're entrepreneurs. They don't have those fears and concerns like I do. What you need to find out is that's not the case. Everybody has it. It's what we call the sweaty palm syndrome. You're going to have it. You're going to have to bite the bullet and move beyond that after you've done the proper amount of research and understanding about a franchise opportunity. As I mentioned, we've helped tens of thousands of people become self-sufficient and accomplish their dream of being in their own businesses over the past 24 years. Interestingly, though, 95% of them ended up in a franchise or a business that they admittedly would have never looked at on their own or had already looked at it and said no. 95%. It's not about walking up and down the aisle or going through the paper or the book of franchises and saying yes, no, maybe. That approach will lead you to the potential of buying yourself a job which is not what a business is designed to do. You don't want to buy yourself a job. It's not what it's designed to do in a business. You want to use a business as a vehicle to accomplish things for you, not buy yourself a job. Many of you, when you're looking for a business in a franchise, you're asking yourself, what am I going to do? So you look at the product or service, and I look at, a, at an automatic transmission franchise, and I say, no way. I don't even know where the transmission in my car is, nor do I care. And I'm certainly not going to get my hands dirty. Okay? It's not going to happen. So in my mind, transmission business is out, right? There'd be no way I'd be a good franchisee. Okay? Not true. In franchising, they don't want you to be the technician. In fact, the mechanic that knows how to fix the transmission would be better off investing in a Dunkin' Donuts franchise. And the baker who knows how to bake donuts would be better off owning an automatic transmission franchise. 95 to 97 percent of the people who own franchises don't have a background experience or knowledge of the product or service that's being provided in that franchise. So it's not about your comfort, it's not about your experience, it's about the business of being in business. That's the way you want to approach it. You've got to keep an open mind. You can't open new doors with a closed mind. 95% average over 24 years ended up in something they would have never looked at on their own when they took the opportunity to go through a discovery approach of looking at their goals, needs, and expectations and comparing those to how to use a business to supply the goals, needs, and expectations for them. So you have to keep an open mind. We talked about this. Sometimes it feels like the boogeyman's under the bed. <laughs> okay? Now, I know that takes us back to our childhood a little bit. Uh, probably something you don't want to go back to. But that's what fear is. False evidence appearing real. Now be honest. How many of you would absolutely swear 
that there was a ghost or a monster in your house when you were a kid? Absolutely. Okay? Was there ever one found? Not exactly. The needle in the haystack syndrome, what's that about? You're going about it looking for a needle in the haystack because you think it takes that needle out of that haystack that you need to find to be successful. It's not about finding a needle in the haystack. Most, if not all, of these businesses out here could be a successful vehicle <clears throat> for you, provided you understand what your goals, needs, and expectations are. Here's the one I like the most. You don't have to love the product or service. Now, those are pictures of outhouses, in case you haven't seen one. Or, I'm sorry, porta potties. Now, you might think that wouldn't be a franchise I'd want to be in. But who knows? So don't have preconceived ideas about the product or service, such as mine about the transmission business. It doesn't matter. Okay? It's a, what matters is, is there a viable business model that's going to work? Definition of insanity. Who knows what that is? Doing the same things over and over again and again and again but expecting the outcome to be different. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, because I know this is a little sensitive, but how many of us have been doing that or are still doing that? We just keep doing what we've been doing, what we know, what we're comfortable with, okay? What we've already done and expecting the things in our lives to change. It's not gonna happen. Now here's a fun one, crabs in the basket. How many of you are from Maryland? Ever been crabbing? Okay, I was born and raised in Maryland. When you go crabbing and you put crabs into a bushel basket, you have to keep the lid on the basket because what will happen? They'll crawl out. After you get a couple layers of crabs and it's actually higher up in the basket, interesting phenomena takes place. You can leave the lid off. Because what happens every time a crab tries to crawl out of the basket when there's a couple dozen other crabs in the basket? They're pulling each other back in the basket. Is it, is it because they don't want their friends to escape? No, they're hanging on because they want to go with you. Okay? And that's what's going to happen to you when you say something as crazy to your family, friends, and relatives I'm going to do my own business. I'm going to invest in a franchise. You're hoping and thinking and wishing that you're going to get a lot of support, but you're going to, it's going to feel like they're trying to hold you back. They're trying to discourage you. The more you step out to do that, the more other people that love you will have concerns, and the more they'll feel inadequate about the fact that they haven't taken that step or started looking themselves. And they'll sometimes unknowingly not support your efforts. You have to be okay with that. Now, when you think about franchising, you look, think about the success statistics and all the great things that are happening in franchising in the economy and the job market, it almost sounds too good to be true. Okay? That's typically over 24 years of tens of thousands of experiences helping people right up to the finish line of investing in a franchise, this is what keeps them back. Because when you go out to look at a business or evaluate a franchise, you might be kidding yourselves that you're going out to, to make sure that it will be successful, to prove that it's going to be a good investment. Guess what we typically go out to do? Disprove it. Some of you have already done that. You go out looking to disprove something so you don't have to take advantage of it so you can go on year after year after year saying I'm going to be in my own business, thinking about being in your own franchise and not having done it because you haven't found one that you couldn't disprove yet. In franchising, it's going to look too good to be true because the results are typically the opposite of non-franchise businesses. Don't get stuck by this. Don't let this hold you back. All of our lives we've been told if something looks too good to be true, then it must not be. How difficult is it to, to, to get beyond that perception? When in fact, there are 
hundreds of franchises in this exhibit hall that are going to look too good to be true, you won't be able to disprove. You'll be able to talk to dozens of people that are succeeding with them that are living the dream of being self-sufficient that you won't be able to disprove it. That's different in a franchise business. Now, it's all going to come down to really what we call cold feet. Um, we all get it. Some of, how many of you have been really close to investing in a business or franchise and, and not gone forward? Anybody? Okay. Sometimes this is what happens. We get cold feet. It's just too uncomfortable. The false evidence appearing real adds up for us and we get a level of concern that won't allow us to do anything further. The key is to remember the definition of insanity. If you keep on doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep on getting what you've been getting. If you have a desire to become self-sufficient and you're afraid that self-employment is too much of a risk for you, what you need is to, to close the gap of information and education and discovery. There's a process out there that allows you to discover what existing franchise business owners already know that only learned that after they took the risk and invested. How valuable would it be for you to experience that in, a, in an, an element where there was no need for you to decide to have to invest in that business, but you could find out what the people that have invested experienced, see what their lifestyle was, what kind of income, lifestyle, wealth, and equity was developed through their venture into the business, and you could accomplish that through a discovery process in a safe zone where there was no investment required and no decisions required whether you were going to do that business after you found out about it. How valuable would that be to you? That's what you need to do. That's the approach you need to take, is you need to dig in and find out what's happening. We have spent 25 years developing a system at the Entrepreneur Source that's unique. It's called the discovery process. It's geared around helping you experience what it is like to be in business without being in business. It's, it gives you an opportunity to discover what people who have taken the step, dealt with the sweaty palm syndromes, invested in themselves in a proactive investment vehicle, and then see what it was like a year after, two years after, three years after, and five years after. That's all you need to understand how much there is out there to offer to you from a franchise experience. The myths are going to keep you from becoming a legend in your own franchise business unless you break out of the syndrome, open your mind, look at things you might not have expected would be the right vehicle for you, and just explore and become well-informed and well-educated. Okay, great audience. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your questions. Appreciate it.